Let's see the doll. Like most people these days, I had a messed up childhood. Who doesn't, right? My father took off before I was born and my mother was left to care for me on her own, a skill she was sorely lacking. My mother slipped right back into the drug-addled party lifestyle she'd enjoyed before I was born and had soon turned our two-bedroom apartment into an opium den. For the first five years of my life, I walked around in a confused, terrifying mist. The smoky opium air would flood down the hallway from our living room and slip underneath my bedroom door. It was always seeming to linger for days. I know now that my mother wasn't a bad person, just a victim of her addictions. When she did have spare money, she would put food in the house or buy me clothes from the Goodwill. The only pieces of furniture I had in my bedroom was a mattress set and a little blue and white toy box. Not that I had a lot of toys to put in it, of course, just the three I had gotten for birthdays. One was an art kit, one was a red wagon, and the last was my pride and joy, a doll named Betsy. Betsy was my best friend. We would have imaginary tea parties together, sleep together, and even take baths together. Sometimes I even remember her voice. When I thought back on our conversations in adulthood, I realized that I was likely suffering from delusions thanks to the always present butts of smoke that laid claim to the dingy hallways and drafty bedrooms of our small apartment. Still, I remember the sound of her voice, a pleasant tingling lilt that was almost always coupled with a giggle. I always remember the things that she said to me and the things she wanted me to do. She asked me to steal, usually food or pens and pencils. She was to bring me, she wanted me to bring her forks and knives and hit the bad man who slept on our couch. It was always something and I would always get in trouble. But she wouldn't. When I told my mother who had put me up to these games, she would scoff and shake her head. She never believed me. Adults never do. Around my sixth birthday, I asked my mother for a birthday party. I wanted to invite the mean girls from school and serve them cake and ice cream to make them like me. I remember standing in the kitchen that day with such high hopes. I had just asked the most important question of my entire life. The glass bottle of Coke I held was shaking in my nervous hands. I waited with bated breath as my mother continued putting groceries away, almost as if she hadn't even heard me. But I knew that she had. Finally, just as I had failed a second time to muster the courage to repeat my question, she turned around and gave me a shake of her head. A birthday party? Laura, that's ridiculous. I can't even afford to feed 15 children that aren't even my own. I can barely afford to feed you. You eat like an elephant especially for a girl your size, or Betsy does. There's hardly anything left for me to eat around here, much less a classroom full of other people's kids. My face fell as she had shook her head, mumbled something else under her breath, and stumbled off to the living room. I heard the music go up, and as more people walked in the door, some left, some stayed. I never knew them either way. It simply was not fair. My mother had parties all the time. What about me? I was a kid. All my friends had birthday parties and now the mean girls at school would know I was too poor to have one and they would treat me even worse than before. I felt the tears start to well in the corner of my eyes and I choked back a sob while I ran to my room and slammed the door behind me. Betsy was sitting on the bed smiling at me. Usually it made me feel better but today it just made me angry. She kept staring at me and smiling. She was going to tell me to do something bad again. This was why my mother wouldn't throw me a birthday party. It was because of all the trouble I got into because of her. This was Betsy's fault. Betsy didn't have to go to school and Betsy never got in trouble like I did. And in my young mind, I truly believed it was the doll, not my mother, who was to blame for everything. I snapped then. I screamed in a rage and threw the drink bottle as hard as I could at that bed. It hit Betsy on the forehead and she fell to the floor. Good. I picked up the bottle and I hit her again and again and again. 
I thought I heard her laugh, and I hit her even harder. Then I laughed. When my rage was over, I dragged Betsy to my toy chest and threw her in it. I slammed it shut and kicked the chest against the wall. I never wanted to see Betsy ever again, ever. I never owned another doll after Betsy. About a week later, the police came and two nice ladies took me to live in a new home, in a new state, with food and toys and no drugs. The trunk went into storage and the wagon disappeared. I never saw my mother again. As I got older, my foster parents admitted she was in jail doing 25 years. That was fine with me. I felt nothing for her anyway. I had nightmares from living with that woman. But slowly I began to heal. I did well in school. I ignored my mother's letters from prison. She reached out to me several times, but I declined the call. That is, until this morning. I'm 30 now with a husband and children of my own. I'm doing well and I'm happy and content. I found out that my mother was released from prison, so I decided to speak to her and let her say her peace. I went out into our shed to call my mother. My old toy chest was stored in there. I sat down on it and dialed my mother's number. Three rings. Hello, Laura? Hello, mother, how are you? Oh, thank you for speaking to me. I know you have your own life now and a family and I would love to meet them someday. I just wanted to tell you how sorry I am for everything. Mother, you're not meeting my kids, ever. And since you asked me, I'm going to say what I have intended to say for years. The opium, the heroin, they destroyed you. And the worst of it is you almost took me down with you. I was five. That was no home for a child. Honestly, I'm surprised it took you so long to get caught. Laura, I understand why you would hate me and that you would want me not to meet your family. I learned a lot about forgiveness while I was away and just... Oh, Laura, I'm so sorry about Betsy. I was confused. What does my doll Betsy have to do with this? Why would you care about her? I know, Laura, believe me, I do. It was all my fault. The drugs and partying and Betsy. If I had only paid attention, if I had only known, she's gone and it's because of me. As my mother began to cry, I tapped my fingers on the toy box impatiently. The drugs had certainly found and fried her brain. Mother, why are you talking about Betsy? And why do you even care? I know where Betsy is. She's right underneath me. What are you talking about, Laura? Oh my goodness, where is she? I shifted uncomfortably. Well, she's in my old toy box, where she's always been. There was a long, airy silence. What do you mean your sister is in the trunk? Sister? What are you talking about? Back on drugs again so soon? That's a record even for you, isn't it? Betsy is a doll, mother. I locked her in my toy box days before you got arrested for possession. Laura, oh no, what have you done? I wasn't arrested because of the drugs. I was arrested because of Betsy's disappearance. You always called her your little doll, but we thought you knew. We thought you knew, Laura. What did you do? My mind had gone blank with no emotion. I sat down the phone next to me and stood up. I could hear the muffled sound of my mother's horrific cries and the dark clutch of possibilities in my own chest. Memories were stirring in the back of my mind, threatening to flood forward into my consciousness. They pushed against a door in my mind that had been locked so tightly for so long that I had forgotten it was even there. Was it even possible? Could the trauma and the opium really lead me to believe that a small child was actually a doll? Begging for food and utensils to eat with, asking me to protect her from the bad man? No, 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 no. I slowly turned around and brought my eyes down the sides of the toy chest. Surely it was too small. You couldn't fit a person in there. You just couldn't. But then, what about a child as small as Betsy was? What about her? 
Would she fit? Would an investigator even bother looking for a person in this chest? I knew I wouldn't. It was just too small. And I was sure we had opened the box at some point over the years, hadn't we? Or had something swimming in the back of my mind always stopped me? I couldn't remember ever seeing it open. I knelt down to the ground and opened the clasps. It would be better not to look. After all that I had overcome, this new life, I had earned this new life. It couldn't all be undone by opening this box. I shouldn't open it. I should forget it ever existed. I should not look inside. I opened the chest. It all came rushing back in one second. I never had a doll. My mother could never afford to buy me one. I never had a wagon either, for that matter. But I did have a toy box, a pretty blue and white toy box. And I finally realized when I was five years old, I had killed my little sister and put her in it. The end.